Let's talk a little bit about King Lear. Yeah. Because Colocross playing King Lear meant a lot to me in that production. The other production of King Lear that is burned in my imagination is Paul Schofield, which I only saw on film. Peter Brooks. Did you see that film? No, I didn't see it. But but that, I, mean, I took from that film what they did on the, what he did on the stage, which was a kind of Churchillian obstinacy, brute obstinacy, and that was what John Colicos took on too. It was very much Churchill. Uh, right. And I, you know, you think it was ridiculous to do a play about a man who's over 80 and grows up when he's over 80. And I think how ridiculous. Then I think about myself, I'm 88, and I've only recently grown up. It's not all that's ridiculous at all. Right. Uh, how so. did you achieve the physicality in that production with John Colicos? That's another large memory of mine as a 13-year-old or 12-year-old was the sheer power, the physicalness of not only Kolokos, I remember him throwing things down the vom, chasing yeah. people away. I remember the physicalness of the heath. I remember the physicality of, of Martha lying blue in death in his arms. Well, it was also the, 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 de the, tension, the tension within his body as an old man. I mean, he did, he did everything that we did was related to his age. It meant he was a fantastically preserved man, obviously was, he'd got that far. Because um, he'd been an active military man all his life. But it was, we, we didn't depart from the idea that we've got... You can't play it like an 80-year-old, you can play it like a maybe 50-year-old, and we are asked to believe that you're that old, because you're exceptional. But how do you as a director encourage a physicalness in a production? Because I've seen you doing very cerebral productions, I've seen you do very kind of stylish productions, and then I see you do, again, you, your palette is wide as a director, because then, then there is a very physical, in-the-body production, as it were, as well as the words being clear and articulate. How do you do that as an actor with a group of performers? I think it's in the, in the, the evolution of the movements of a scene, or the actual, ev of, of the f physical events that happen that are most important like carrying her. I mean, I won't tell you awful stories about what people have to take before they come on carrying her after that long performance. And if you have a tall, a heavy uh, Gordelia, you really are in trouble. I know Paul had to take some particular medicine before he came on every night, some sort of tonic, which had a, a terrible effect in a way on him because it made him fart a lot, but he just came straight on with her. And every night, a little trumpet sound going on. You ask for the cast and they get used to it <laughs> until he put her down. What makes, what's a good actor for you? What do you look for in an actor? Well, I've run sco a school for a long time. And the first thing you look for is a sense of humor, a sense of rhythm, a, sensi a general sensitivity an imagination, uh, and a, 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 a physical a pliability. And then I think, I suppose, I think of aspect of people with courage. It's very important to know that you're, you know, if you're really going to get anywhere with it. Will they take the risk? Because acting is often, you know, you can't plan it. The, the, the actor has to go out on a limb often when, in a way the director can't even conceive, but if they get someone with a part, they can really take risks with it. And that's, you know, in, a, in choosing young students, and it's a damn difficult thing to do. Because mm. uh, the ones who are good at auditions, you know, often aren't uh, not much good at anything else except... It's a skill unto itself. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and certain actors have a truth about what they do. What is that? Honesty. Well, I think it's easier to be tr truthful on a thrust stage than it is uh, on a picture frame stage, as I was saying, because you can keep the physical relationship more real, more honest. Let's talk about actors' training a little, because you did run Juilliard, mm. the acting program at Juilliard, and you have 
worked with young actors here. When you bring a young actor along, what are you trying to do with them? Well, in this case, it's obviously introducing them to Shakespeare, introducing them to the idea of, of Shakespeare's thoughts, you know, being long journeys. That don't, when you're on a thought process, don't take a downward inflection, because you lose us if you do, but only let us know when you've finished. You reach the end of the journey, then we've got the whole thing as you got it, you know, it's living, it is living. Uh, just the, the, the tricks of the, of the, the verse, which is and not dealing with the, the difficulty with rhyme. Don't ever emphasize the rhyme. Or and when you're like talking about the verse and the structure of the thought within the verse, are you talking technically? You're saying, well, just keep it up, the inflections up? Or are you talking to the actor about the interior of the thought as well? Well, it's got, I mean, the thought, the thought is in the process of formulating. You don't start with the thought. You start with the, 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 sort of the first elements of, of what, what you're trying to say, and you get launched. You want to get, have to get launched with, and then you go on a, a journey into the unknown. Of course you're obeying the, the rules, but the rules being simple. It's like music. It'd be, uh, you have five stresses in a line. Of those five stresses, maybe one or two need emphasis, deserve emphasis, which will make the sense fall on the ear very easily. If you don't do that, if it's always rum ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum then you don't get any emphasis in it and you get bored. We get bored because we haven't been led anywhere. Uh, and, and it's a question of making the right choice of emphasis. And often uh, a line, at the end of the line, it's like taking your foot off the pedal of a piano while you're playing it. There was a little bit of uh, air there, but o o often a, a, a word, which is a very unusual word to use, will come in at the beginning of a line and you think, oh, he's just thought of it at that moment. It's absolutely spontaneous choice. Because mm -hmm. uh, in Shakespeare, the the consumer, the exp expressor of feeling and thought, or thought mainly more, much more than feeling. Feeling will follow, it'll find its own way. Uh, it's the thought that's, that, that is really the hard thing to get at, to get the real rationale, the real meaning of rhetoric, of, of what it is, debate within yourself about the pain you're suffering in your life. That will be obvious if you get the thought right. So it makes us feel, oh God, don't think down that lane, it's going to lead you nowhere, that sort of thing. Um, and what would you say to a young actor that says, but that, that doesn't feel natural, that doesn't feel real, if okay. I'm trying to follow this? Okay, well, uh, take, take a line that is very uh, critical in Measure for Measure, when a young boy is told he's got to die by his sister, because he's, he's disobeyed the law, and that the answer is to be killed. And uh, his, his, he has a line uh, after, and it's just you know, easy line, I, but to die and go, we know not where. And obviously scared. Now, my, it's my belief, and I think it's peculiar to my own feeling about Shakespearean speech, is if you have one word ending in a particular consonant and the next word ending in either the same consonant or a similar consonant, you must break between those two words. Never let them run together. So if you take the line, I but, see, to die. If there's a pause after but, then obviously it's, there's some difficulty in saying the next word. There's some difficulty in facing death. I but, to die. And go, go we, go we. Go we is not a follow-on. You can't, and go, it has to be go, break, we. And go, we know not where. Now that's a very genuine feeling put there technically by the author, consciously working for the actor, encouraging students to be wanting to make a working relationship with this author. And that tells a huge story. Does it make any sense to you? It does, absolutely. Do you put much credence in the, these thoughts about first folio? and the different spellings and the different capitalizations. I can't, I can't be bothered with it. Because that's somewhat down the same line, saying look for the clue that Shakespeare has actually, since he's writing for the actor, he's yeah. not writing for the literary agent, he's not writing no, for the university right. professor, he's actually writing for the actor. So intuitively he would be 
trying to write his indications to the actor as he writes, as you say, if the mm -hmm. two consonants are like that, means this. Yes. It's an interesting take on why there are strange capitalizations, why there are l lines with so many consonants. I've, I've never been um, diligent enough to bother with it. Oh, you probably don't need to. Well, I, I mean, I feel I've sensed it out already. I'm, hap I'm happy where, where I am with it, because I think it's, I think we've inherited an absolutely magnificent language. And when I first heard it, and listened to it in a play of Shakespeare's, when I was, I think, 13 years old at, uh, uh, I was at school near the near Oxford, and so I used to go to see the Rouds uh, uh, productions, and I saw Richard the Second there, which is a difficult play. There's so much rhyme in it, but I knew then that I thought this is what a what a language I've inherited. Of course, I didn't understand half of it, but my life since then has been dedicated to try and understand it. I mean, when I was thinking of doing this interview, I was thinking of talking to you, and I thought, you're there's a a small group of people in the world who have spent most of their professional lives in that garden called Shakespeare. And every time I briefly step in that garden, I walk away enriched. And you've spent most of your life walking through that garden. I mean, right. that's an I know, I'm incredible. very, very lucky. Yeah, I, I, I know that. Uh, How do we get the people who fund theatres, either the corporate people or the government, to understand that wealth? I think you, by by doing do, by doing Shakespeare first by doing Shakespeare better than we have before by doing, making Shakespeare really live in a way that people can't resist by doing things that satisfy those already involved already those already. Um, um, take it, uh, your part, part, uh, followers, you know, you'll come, mm -hmm. who tend not to come when you start to do Shakespeare for some other purpose than the depth of really revealing a play. When you start to do Shakespeare primarily to suit the teenager, which sometimes happens. It, that's the director's purpose. Was, I want to get these teenagers, because then they'll grow into real theatre goers. What about those people who are already theatre goers, who are turned off by your bothering to do, by your doing that? I, I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I, I, I think, and I think by, it amazes me, although the, the show isn't ready yet because we haven't had enough rehearsal time, but the program I'm doing at the moment, which is about the um, uh, sonnets, the audience reaction to it obviously is, is a reaction of people who are really interested. They really love this subject. They want to know more about what could it possibly mean this, this cycle of science. What, what could these affairs mean? I mean, it, who, was the, who was the dark lady? Gordon Craig said it was Shakespeare's cat. <laughs> I mean, this, everything is possible, but we're not doing it with a cat. Oh, <laughs> dear me. Um, 